Good afternoon from Bangkok. This is Leah Shortino, the founder and director of C Junction. And C Junction, as you know, is this venue based in Bangkok, which focuses on Southeast Asia. And since the coup three years ago in Myanmar, we have devoted attention to what is happening in the country in the belief that it's not only for the country, but also for very important relevance for the rest of the region as we are seeing these days in Thailand too. So that we have tried to have all kinds of events and one of those is these updates which provide short information about what has been happening in the last month. And we have done this since the very beginning with different resource person. We are very lucky now to have a partnership with Misima and also to have as resource person Tozalat, who is a well-known journalist and expert on uh, Myanmar, from Myanmar, an expert on Myanmar. And he has already since uh, two, three times already provided updates. And this update is particular uh, important since we are very concerned about the conscription that are happening in Myanmar or are planned to happen. So we look forward to hearing from you. Please go ahead. As usual, you have about 20 minutes and then we will have question and answers. Thanks for your introduction, Leah. Um, yeah, I'd like to acknowledge uh, one of the journalists, Potiha got K in A. He was arrested in Miaoud and then when he ran the Miao police station, they found the five bodies. One of them happened to be one of our fellow journalists. So this is the what journalists are facing inside Myanmar. So like you said, Leah, at the moment, the one of the hottest topics is this, you know, conscription law, which is a, a mandatory a army service that they introduced. So today my talk is very much um, based on that specific event. Um, so the uh, SAC uh, Army Military Honda announced 10th February as a law, uh, con uh, the conscription law impacted on 40 million Burmese youth, male aged between 18 to 30, and the female 18 to 27 mandatory service. And I think it is now all the uh, it is it is widely regarded as modern fauna slavery for youth, and also it is an army, Burmese army showing off their power that you know they can do whatever they like. Especially, I mean, they have Burmese army facing two serious problems. One is about their recruitment, they and they have in a very, very uh, uh, ongoing uh, conflict war civil war. Uh, in many many area in in Burma, Myanmar, so they are have facing a very low morale army, and also very low uh, recruitment. Uh, people that are not joining army, even the very prestigious as Defense Service Academy (DSA), you know, their capacity four hundred and sixty. They are getting only seventy eight last year. So that is that is one reason that they they want to impose this uh, new law. Actually, it's not new law. It was a Late data you know, in 2010, but didn't really actually activate that. But this time they are activating it. So what we are expecting is at least 10% of these impacted uh, by Miss Youth. And I'm talking about 1.4 million at least, where, I mean, looking, uh, trying to avoid this, you know, mandatory uh, army service. I don't know how, but there is a, so far we are witnessing exodus and lots of, Young Burmese now living to Thailand or India or, or other Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Singapore, but majority to Thailand. And even, you know, Thailand already announced so many restrictions, not only at the visa session in, in Yango, but also on the border post. And there are lots of very active illegal and border crossing activities happening. So I think, you know, especially those young people. Also inside Burma, it is fear that a lot of parents or young people themselves, I mean, like if you live in dormitory, I mean, and those, you know, um, affiliate guys go to go and take the list. And also on top of that, there is a corruption. If you want to get away, you have to pay a huge sand. So there is a kind of pay 
opportunity for uh, Burmese army uh, to uh, to collect money, uh, kind of officially, because uh, they can check, you know, and you are in the list or not. If you want, then you pay money to get away with that. So there is a, a fear, corruption, and also, of course, you know, um, there will be some exemption, like medical exemption, or if you are married, or there is a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, opportunity for corruption for these uh, uh, apartheid that start uh, actively working, and then you know now the youth, even the journalists. I mean, I know five journalists with my own friends. They are the under age. They are within that age. I mean, two girls and three. They have to. They have to run away. There is no way they want to serve in the army, and also at the same time. I mean, equally, the resistance also recruiting very actively. If you don't want to serve in the Burmese army, then come and join with us. So far, we are witnessing like uh, PDF, People Defense Force, Rangoon, they got more than what they need. So this is what happened, what phasing for, for Burmese youth, you know, there is a nowhere in between. Also, there is a huge impact on that region and mainly in Thailand, Laos, immediate neighbor. And India and ASEAN as a whole. Uh, this is this is the this is the one of the bad timing for the young people to to maintain or to to survive, simply survive inside Burma, Myanmar. So next slide, please. Um, army also very actively going around. This is the Burmese army going around and explaining the law, not to be panicked. You know, it is how how it's going to benefit because uh, I mean this is. Uh, at the same time, they are showing off their power that they are in control. They can make any law that they want. Uh, 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 also, it is the brightest of, brightest of their power. So they go on the ground with the guns and giving the explaining the, uh, the ordinary people that, you know, you should serve in the army. This, you know, conscription law, mandatory army law. And uh, then next slide, please. Also, they do, Burmese Army do. This is saying that we support the conscription law. So there is a, a state sponsor or, or army sponsor gathering everywhere saying that this is the just, just, this is the just uh, law. And so if you are pat patriotic and join the army, so they they do not only a uh, law or law apartheid, they found the comedy, but also they do organize. In Burma, Myanmar, you know, there is no way you can have a demonstration unless the uh, army sponsor demonstration. These are the demonstration the army sponsor, basically pro um, conscription law uh, here and there. This is in, in, in Yango saying that, you know, we support this conscription law. Next slide, slides, please. So this is in front of Thai embassy in Yango. Recently, Thailand and uh, Thai embassy in Yango limited only 400 visa application a day. Because uh, it is overwhelmingly, you know, those young people who has passport, they they want to apply um, a Thai visa. So it is like a huge long queue. And also, if you are a young people, it's between eighty to thirty. So hard to leave country because of this limitation. You know, that's why I said, I mean, this conscription law, and a lot of people think it is a beginning of the end of the army rule as well, but. This is again deliberately targeting the younger generation that make it very, very difficult, you know, uh, to take sides and 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 uh, and there is a huge impact on the region, especially neighboring country like Thailand. So this is a, a Thai embassy in Yango. Um, next slide, please. So now I want to uh, go to a little bit of uh, military operation. So far, there is active army operation called one 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 one. It's Part of 1027, I mean, 27 out of uh, operation in the northern Shan state, close to India border. This is also follow up Rakai, three brotherhoods uh, alliance. Now they are within three months, they overrun six townships and it's quite intense. Now army is losing ground. What they do, they blow up a lot of bridge. The bridge is already gone and to stop reinforcement by uh, Arakanese army overrunning and uh, there will be very likely that also another interesting uh, important geo geopolitical important is Arakan is the only state where there is a more than 3,000 miles or uh, coastal line 
and a lot of Chinese investment like OBOR, uh, one belt, one road, only touching Taoqiu, that area. That is a deep seaboard, a gas pipeline. And also India in investment, which is called a uh, Kaladan, uh, Kaladan uh, uh, development zone. So it is also what if A going to overrun all the entire area? They said already 70% of territory controlled by A now. They are aiming for their, their, their capital, Sidri. It says the numbers are day. They were, I, I'm sure they were do it. And about this particular military operation, these are the extended operational um, uh, 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 1027 to 1111. And uh, so far, no media coverage. And uh, the previous journalists got killed in that particular area because uh, even you know, receiving independent information is crime, regarded as crime in that particular conflict area. So this is not only the military uh, military uh, uh, operation, but also it's also impact on a lot of a lot of uh, investment and, and and trading activities. It is also a border with Bangladesh and 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 also Bangladesh and India, uh, one of the Chinese Chinese investment. So definitely, you know, there will be just a matter of time that it is going to take over a lot of a lot of a lot of area uh, control, and also. Militarily, it is the only uh, Navy fighting. And uh, next slide, please. And there is a lot of fighting by the aeroplane, aeroplane a lot of bombing. There is every, every day there is bombing. Uh, and, but this is the another significant is it, because of this, you know, three thousand kilometer uh, uh, coastal line. There is a first time there is a Navy, Burmese Navy, uh, actively involved. And then uh, within three months, you know, uh, uh, Arakanis Army managed to send. Nine, uh, nine ships, and uh, also, it is also. I mean, it is a coordinated attack with the with the uh, 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 three brothers who align in the north in, on the China border. So this is the on the on the west this is in the India border. So um, I think what is their future? Three brother who military ambition. I'm sure you know Chinese New Year is over. I mean, from the north, they, there is their military target. For the A, they also they have a another military ambition of taking over capital of Rakhine State, Sidre. And also they want to take control of these lucrative investment and also their trading uh, posts. This is about the military operation update uh, so far. And uh, next slide, please. So this is a uh, economy, uh, um, because this is also A or uh, all the red dot is what the A overrun. So most of the area already under their control. All the trigger, all the map is, uh, map is small, and the, the blue trigger and the uh, 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 yellow trigger, it is the Indian investment and Chinese investment. You know, you can easily get this map on uh, the ISP, uh, Institute for Strategy and uh, Policy uh, website that is uh, in Burmese. It is also, uh, they show in that, you know, the territorial area control of Arakanese army and also the location of uh, geopolitical location of the uh, Chinese and India uh, investment. So it's, it is significant because not only militarily, but also economically, that area is very significant. But it, again, you know, um, it is just a matter of time that they will be uh, clearly going to overrun very soon. So far, there is no communication very rare communication and uh, all the communication is cut out. And also please bear in mind that that area also recently a uh, cyclone and uh, mocha uh, in that area. Most of the area, uh, uh, the, the farmland is, you know, um, uh, a lot of salt water. So there will be a lot of uh, humanitarian crisis already happening. And on top of that, there is army retreating a lot of outputs and blowing up all the infrastructure bridge every bridge, most of the bridge are already brought, blown up to stop a advancing into some of the strategic areas. So we are keeping our eyes and very difficult to get information in and out of that area. But I think it is very significant, you know, uh, what a, what if a run over all over the area, then what will be the future? I mean, the Chinese gas pipeline or Indian, Indian, um, uh, Kaladan, and development so we are also keeping our eyes on this particular area next please 
Having said that, this is a ministry of commerce. It is all the negative impact of that border trade. In Burma, Myanmar, and GDP is around 70 billion. Border trade make around 15 billion, mainly China border. The first road is Myanmar, China border trade. You can easily go to the, the Ministry of Commerce website and you can see there is a Myanmar, Thailand. Again, you know, we are in the Thai side too. And this morning, KNU, and Korean National Union announced they control 60% of Kokori, which is one of the main trade in route, Asia Highway. Uh, and uh, a lot, a lot with the uh, uh, resistance control. And now Myanmar, Bangladesh, and Myanmar, India, and Myanmar, Laos. So the these are the all comparative uh, uh, trading border trading import export, and there is a deficit. Uh, almost all the major trade ports uh, stop at, and that is because of ongoing conflict along the along the border trade, mainly very intensely in in China Burma border. And Chinese are very curious and we don't know who is going to take what kind of tax if if there is a resume of the trading activities and because of, there is a five border trading port or controlled by five different groups. And same to Thailand, Myanmar, and Myanmar Thailand border and also Bangladesh, India and Laos. So these are the another uh, another impact of conflict on the Border trade alone, so it, there is a significant shortage of goods and and and, and services in Burma, Myanmar. On top of uh, there is two point six million humanitarian IDPs crisis, so there will be another economic crisis uh, on top of this humanitarian crisis uh, uh, happening now. So this is the economic uh, impact on the uh, of the conflict. Next slide, please. And. Then again, because of a Rakhai, um, there is another racial tension. This is in Mandalay. This is the big pagoda. Actually, ancient times, you know, Burmese kingdom beat the Rakhai kingdom and bring that 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 Buddha image to Mandalay. And there is a there is a sticker saying that don't buy, don't buy from Rakhai a restaurant. So there is a deliberate racial tension, and um, by by Burmese army, uh, mainly targeting Rakhai in Mandalay or Rakhai in Yango. A lot of Yakai young people, both, you know, in the, on the aeroplane or on the buses, they've been arrested. So there is a, another very dangerous potential racial tension between Rakhai and Burma. So this is also delivery attempts by the, by the Burmese army. So, you know, this is a very widely circulated uh, anti-Rakhai movement happening. So again, in Rakhai, another international crisis is about Rohingya. What if a overrun Rakhai state? What will be the future of one million Rohingya and, and refugee living in Bangladeshi border? We don't know yet. So I think it is dangerous to have a provoke, provoking you know, of the Rakhai, Myanmar, um, and racial tension. We very worry about that because of. I mean, racism, racism, we we against all found of racism and also very dangerous political uh, trend to have a racist intention, but definitely I mean, is doing that. So so that is, you know, again, with the military operation, another interesting question will be, what will be the future of Rohingya who live in Bangladesh about repatriation or there is a lot of mixed messages that Burmese army uh, making alliance with the I mean, the uh, Rohingya uh, extremists, or, or, or uh, there is a lot of report about it. So, I mean, but what we are seeing is there is a both, you know, uh, uh, state sponsor reach a riot between Rakhai and Burma uh, in the uh, happening in, in Manila uh, uh, and Yango, big city. Um, so, that is also we are very worried and we're very concerned about this racial uh, tension. Uh, next slide, please. And about the humanitarian crisis, this is the real picture. Somehow, you know, the bullet got into the rice uh, cooking pot in one of the one of the area. Um, there is, I mean, at least uh, Thailand. I mean, they've been delayed. I mean, already three years. Um, but now Thailand initiating on behalf of ASEAN or on behalf of other and about their. Thai Red Cross to Burmese Red Cross, they are delayed from last month. 
But now they are saying that there will be Thai dealing with Myanmar Red Cross about humanitarian corridor starting from next month. So they want to distribute 20,000 people, you know, and but uh, so far a lot of critics saying that Myanmar Red Cross is not independent. So humanitarian principle is none. Uh, impartiality, but the Myanmar Red Cross and other military, they have very close ties. And so far, there is no official response from Bami Sami. So that is also, I mean, question of impartiality about this humanitarian delivery, whether it is possible, but there will be a hard center, ASEAN humanitarian assistance center will monitor. So let's see, you know, and uh, early first week of March, time where time is now gathering and those supply from Thai side, then uh, going to cross. And also what missing is the, that those area, other side of the Myawadi, this, and uh, 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 is Myawadi and current area, territorially current control most of the town. What will be the, what about the current, the local stakeholder? Are they part of this deal? So far, no, not yet. That's why current is not very happy. They keep an eyes on these newly engaged, but we, we are uh, very, op I mean, uh, uh, very skeptical, but we we like to be, uh, we like to be, uh, see any, at least, you know, because of three years, there is no attempt to address humanitarian uh, crisis need. So I think we are also very concerned and we are also very much keeping our eyes on this latest development from Thailand. Um, and also another question that linked to conscription what I mean about the recruitment army trying to Burmese army trying to recruit them and also the resistance want to recruit them. What about those Burmese youth don't want to join any fighting? Is there any room or is there any specific uh, program that we should initiate? We should consider, especially for youths, you know, who are in very difficult position about not joining the fight or, or, or Burmese army or resistance. Is there any room for the you know, these potential youth. I'm talking about around 1.4 million, you know, at least 10% of Burmese youth were run away uh, for this uh, conscription law. So very likely they will be under the Thailand or borderline or, you know, in some library, so-called library area for sure. So we need to specifically consider uh, the future um, uh, role of this Burmese youth uh, who don't want to engage active and um, struggle from both sides, you know, Burmese army or the others, you know, uh, resistant groups. But so far, there is no specific thinking or plan for these, you know, impeded youth. So I think maybe we better use this time uh, as a as a good opportunity to start thinking about how what kind of service we can offer for those, you know, Burmese youth who are in trouble and who are in need of help in these critical times. Next slide, please. So I will st start with my presentation. This is the current area, one of the school. This is how student studies. Um, I mean, because of the, a lot of air raid. So I hope that a lot of politicians say in 2024, as a years of change. I'm not sure about what kind of change, but I think I want to regard this 2024 as year of saving life. How can we save life? I mean, both, you know, and humanitarian address, addressing the humanitarian needs or or or, or engage with the stakeholder. I mean, there is no one pathway. There will be many pathway to save uh, Burmese life. That will be end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we have quite a lot of question already. So two actually relate to the uh, Rohingya situation. Uh, we have read, this is one of the question uh, about, we have heard reports coming out about Rohingya being conscripted into the military, uh, the Myanmar military, some say to, to be used as targets or avant-post during the attack. This could again create uh, ethnic conflict. And uh, what you think about that? Related to that, what you have said about the victory of the Arakan army, I mean, possibly advance to take over the capital. 
uh, what would be the implication for the Rohingya if that is the case? Uh, these are uh, related to uh, the Rohingya. The, another question is about India. There has been some new that they want to close uh, the borders, uh, which have been always open for people of both sides to go and meet the family, etc. So traditionally, uh, that was the case. Are they serious about closing uh, the border? And if so, what what can be done? And uh, last question, Baba. Okay, let's do these three first. <laughs> and then All right. we go. All right. I will try to and that Rohingya issue will be very complicated one, as we all know, and it is a crisis deadlock. You know, there is no solution for quite a long time. But now it's a wars. I mean, the, the things get in, you know, uh, wars and wars and because uh, apparently he ran a lot of border posts. Then you know there was Burmese army and soldier more than three hundred ran into Bangladesh, and there was a one report that. They they given them uh, they negotiate with the uh, Rohingya extremists, those uh, Burmese security forces to get into Bangladesh, and even they once once they run away, they sold with the ten million Taka weapons to the Rohingya. <laughs> that is a very interesting development because uh, Arakan is advancing the Burmese uh, border uh, police and security outposts. So the closer they have to run away. Now Bangladesh, they send them back. They repatriate 300, but they cannot bring the guns and all the ammunition. So they sold it. That is a one report that, you know, whether Amit is, uh, Amit is uh, dealing with the uh, uh, Rohingya extremists. Uh, that is a, also a very interesting question. Of course, the guns and uh, other they, they left behind or because of, they would say that also there is conscription law, Rohingya. They are not never regarded as a citizen or they are always regarded as a second class citizen <laughs> but when it's come to conscription law no, no discrimination so they want to recruit we had a lot of a lot of reports that they are going to the villages you know asking the young people to join you have to do the mandatory uh, the service it is on the ground we also we have been a very difficult getting access because of the communication are uh, almost black up um, heavy military operation. So first thing they do, I mean, the both side, there is no communication, no phone line. Even channel is very hard to get. So we are trying to verify all these claims. But whatever, uh, that is uh, one of the reasons, you know, whether uh, both, you know, uh, whether Bami Sami trying to recruit Rohingya as a potential, uh, a potential uh, new recruitment. So there is a lot of accusation and hard to verify that I will put it that way, because uh, simply, a lot of communication blackout. That is that is my honest question. But there is a lot of indication that also very likely that security force more than three hundred run into Bangladesh. Bangladesh uh, border guard they return them after that to the Burmese army. Then they have to leave all the camp. Uh, but those camp are not not occupied by the area, but they leave it to the other third party. And there is a very active and uh, conscription and uh, recruitment activity happening in the village village of the Rohingya as well. Another question, Rohingya question, what if a overrun control? Is there any issue? So far, I never, I don't have any a specific policy on Rohingya. What is their stand or policy? But they they are very much concentrated on their Rakhida way, Rakhai way, which is like more uh, confederation or liberation. So I think maybe at some point they have to address Probably good opportunity to turn this policy into, you know, a bit more proactive. I mean, on the humanitarian ground, there is little glimpse or hopes to treat Rohingya as a human. You know, that is, if it is can maneuver or if they are in control, we like to see that happen. You know, doesn't matter what's your color or who you are or Rohingya or maybe good chance to at least acknowledge them as a human being and on the human right, human humanitarian ground to reintegrate into a maybe whether a will take that as a opportunity or chance. We have to wait and see. So far, I don't see any active policy yet. But if they are going to be in in control of the particular location, Rakhai, where they share with Bangladesh uh, border and also the uh, lot of Rohingya, they have they should have a 
specific outline about it. But so far, they have other priority. But it's not too late to start thinking about it. This is maybe the best that I can answer because Rohingya is a very complex issue. <laughs> you may even get the Nobel Peace Prize if you have a solution. But as a journalist, as far as also the, I mean, uh, they also, I mean, the physically, it is very hard to get. All the communication is down. And uh, we have some journalists on the ground using satellite to get a, even get in the new ongoing heavy fighting uh, day to day, you know. All, also, the media, known as a big fighting, already too much in, intense. Because the army also seriously defended. And there is a, because of the Chinese investment, huge gas pipeline. And also, uh, there, is a, there is a seaport. You know, all the wines and tanga come from uh, Iran and other to China is from there. So it is, it is again, very geopolitically, very important and location. We are also keeping an eye. That is about the, my best, you know, uh, trying to answer, address about Rohingya. But I think there is also opportunity to address Rohingya issue if it is serious about, you know, about the, uh, uh, they are serious about Rakhai state or Rakhai uh, liberation in the Rocky that way. Why not, you know, consider about uh, Rohingya as a, as a human. I mean, as a, as a, another, I mean, historically they were there. So that is their change. About the India, I think, I don't think it is a right decision. I think India is also, we thought, you know, in 1980, India was very, very helpful. We have a Air India radio program, India work and support, and one of the world's biggest democratic country, like it or not. But about this last three years, very funny. Recently, Indian Foreign Correspondent Club invited the Burmese army, you know, son of the Admiral, you know, the Navy chief, who is not journalist, but they invite him, very controversial within the journalists. And also now they want the, to restrict free movement. They want a big fans. I don't think fans in physical barrier never work unless, you know, people, people are willing to collaborate. Also, they are desperate. I know around 60,000. Chin state. Chin state is, by the way, 80% under resistance control, border with the India border. Now, Rakhine is another border. So, Chin is already declared their own Chin land council. They have their own administration. Whether India start considering to deal with that, they should. Because, uh, I mean, the states and the um, army as the institution no longer relevant. There are many other institutions, many other uh, state uh, within state. Uh, happening. So they should start opening the channel. So far, we don't see that. Also, India, instead of funds in people movement, they why don't they facilitate, you know, as a, another humanitarian corridor from India border? I send the journalists from all the way to Thailand to uh, India, all the way they reach to the Maguire, and there is potential. There is a very good uh, infrastructure on the border. They even have a husky chopper, the state government, you know, sponsor. And uh, has key service. Why don't they carry the medicine or, or you know some humanitarian relief? And I mean that's why my presentation ended with the 2024 as you know potential uh, saving life. I think this is a good opportunity for Indian government instead of funds and uh, giving a hand and 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 also open up another uh, humanitarian corridor. You know I don't think physical funds or they are. I mean only uh, army. A center, a state center approach not going to work. It's it's very outdated. Also, they are very involved. I mean, about their, I don't know what is going on with the India current government. They are, they've been very proactive, you know, for since ADADA, but now this time, no, other way around. We are very, very disappointed about Indian, you know, recently Indian Army engaged and also they are sent into the Defense Service Academy. Now we, are, we keep our eyes very well. And so we are very worried about Indian uh, government approach, you know, which is which is I mean, not very effective and not working at all. So I think they should they should consider other other uh, pragmatic approach that you know benefit for the uh, both both of the resident along the border instead of uh, instead of putting that big fence. It's not going to work. That's my <laughs> trying to answer this question. That is also another difficult question. Again, related to India, the difference between the national government and the local government of India, the neighboring uh, 
region seems to be more tolerant than the national government, the Indian national government. I mean, what is your impression of that? Another question about the Chinese government. Uh, they intervened uh, before uh, for the Northern Alliance and military as a bridge, although it does, didn't really work out as, as planned or it's good to know what you think about that. But do you think, the question is whether you think they will intervene also uh, to try to bridge again between the Arakan army and the military. And the third about the conscription yeah, and the impact uh, for Thailand particularly, uh, and what can be done to ensure Thailand has a welcoming attitude uh, toward this young population. All right. And uh, this is related to another question just arrived about, do you have anything to say for young people from Myanmar who are panicking about this? Okay. All right, I try to, I mean, that is always a central and local government issues about the India the same same to China that is a, a, a Chinese you know a Pekin and and also a Yunnan is different that is always argue because of the different uh, interests I think locally I mean the, whoever asks this question it's right I mean the local uh, Indian government and uh, both Mizoran Izo they very tolerant and they are they want to different also there was a uh, we have to accept that there was a rich attention recent recently in the northeast India. But it is, I think, more about Delhi, right? It is a government, foreign policy, and border affair. And but I think always, you know, there is, and a local government is more friendlier than the central government. I have to put it that way. That's how. Otherwise, those refugees. I mean, we have to thank. We really sincerely thanks those local government who trying to help. And I mean, sixty thousand refugees is quite quite huge population to bear. And in uh, in a small state, and, and and but I think it is that a uh, central government should have a active policy, and and this is my very short answer. And really, really thanks to the local government that you know a bit more flexible, and a bit more willing to help the refugees, those who are in need, that is on the ground. But the same argument go to Pekin and and on the uh, uh, Yunnan government too. Because the Yunnan government want to do the uh, tr uh, trading activities very actively, but Pekin is different. About the Chinese in the Arakan issue, other ways around. On the Northern Alliance in Kokan, Tianle, in the in the Chinese border, those are the need Chinese because uh, there is no way supply come from Burmese side. Or Burmese army already blocked. Only if they are survivor, they need supply from Chinese side. So the those at the net really, really depend on Chinese or I mean survival need. But the Arakan is other way around. It is the Arakan Chinese need Arakan is massive, but Arakan is also part of the three brother who alliance. And it is a strategic only OBOR touching point is the Chaoqiu deep sea port. One by one road. Xi Jinping is very serious about that. But is it the Chinese need? Arakan, more than Arakani Chinese in that situation. But the Chinese already, I mean, uh, already broke it, broke three times, truce. But it seemed like nobody listening. Bami Sami preacher, the three brother <laughs> preacher. So I think, you know, if I'm a Chinese, they, they must be really, really painful that all their negotiations fail. I mean, already three times serious. But now a lot of, a lot of rumor that there will be another attempt at a negotiation. Um, to have at least, you know, cease hostility uh, from the ASEAN. Chinese are very active with ASEAN too. Very likely, you know, even the uh, army. Army always looking for their exit. If they are in very, I mean, pressure, like militarily, and the conscription law is there. One of the, they are admitted, they have to be admit that, you know, they have a serious problem. Then they will, they may negotiate with the NUG or very likely, but I'm very cynical. They only use it is not for the long sake of the long lasting peace. It is just to ease the pressure 
military pressure than other pressure, like economic pressure and, and, and military pressure or other pressure. But I think China will try another round of negotiation. So do uh, ASEAN. Uh, let's see. Um, I think that's 2024 will be very busy years about negotiation and trying to uh, negotiate from both sides or the uh, or the or the state party. And uh, um, about the Thai, your question about Thai attitude to uh, uh, those young people. I think so far, you know, um, they already closed. Uh, 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 not close. You can no longer come to Chiang Mai from Tachi Lai, Mesa and Tachi Lai. In the past, you can, if you have an ID card, you leave your ID card one week, they already block it. And same, the time prime minister, he already won, but means come illegal way. Otherwise, there will be a consequence. But there are a lot of illegal uh, activities. There is everyday arrest because of illegal, mainly young people. But I think, you know, what I think probably time should start thinking about temporary shelter. That is uh, for the youth, I mean, specifically who are in Badat about this one, you know, and on top of other, trying to address other refugees, you know, there are a lot of refugees along there. This is the, another situation. Maybe some temporary, they should consider a kind of recognition, shelter, you know, or maybe even on the library area, maybe we need, I mean, we we, we can't even think about, uh, uh, we need to uh, find an innovative way. You know, all the way that we know, it's no longer relevant because of, uh, but this crisis is getting big and it is not only national problem, it's become a regional problem. You see all the illicit drugs and uh, uh, scammer, all the crimes, drug, human trafficking, now that young people running away. So this is this become a regional, regional problem. Also it's important on Thai security, et cetera. That's why Thai start to think many innovative, uh, pragmatic way, especially dealing with and Burmese problem. And also it's not only merely Burmese internet politics. It is it is it has huge impact on uh, ASEAN and in particular neighboring countries like Thailand, Laos, India, and China that we are talking about, you know, this is and Bangladesh. These are the issues. About the Burmese youth, I mean, this is the illegal region. I mean, the, since uh, day one, you know, although there's a 2008 constitution, only president can declare a state of emergency. So the the Burmese army, they preach their, their own constitution. They arrest the president. So since day one, you know, first February, this is no longer a legitimate region. So all their law, you know, why do you need to obey? Why don't you say no? I mean, there is no right that you can force me to join the army, you know, for the youth. This is the message that, you know, I mean, because this is not the not the legitimate uh, legal region, military Honda. They are, the, they are the coup maker and they are not implementing, you know, they are coup success. So I don't think there's no no need to obey their law, but I, it is easy to say, but you know, there is really institution at gunpoint, you know, hard to say no uh, and uh, military boots, you know, I mean, but for the youth, I think they they they, they, they should say no. I mean, 17 million, 40 million, 6.7 million made and seven by more women are in Bada. Can you see? There is a more woman population in Burma. So 7.3 million women. It is quite serious, um, age between 18 to 27. For me, I mean, they, they, have to, they don't need to obey. This is, this is not the just law. I mean, they have to define, you know, unlawful uh, encroachment. I mean, the conscription law. But I mean, for me, easy, but it is reality, you know, very harsh. Um, but I think also uh, picking up guns and, I mean, that's why we need a, um, we also, we, sh we should start thinking about those who don't want to fight, both, you know, Burmese army or the resistance. Is there any other solution? I mean, from uh, regional and international community, what can we offer? That's why that is also another big question that we have to think about, another innovative engagement, saving these young youths, you know. But for me, I mean, it is unjust law. They don't have to um, uh, uh, do uh, imply it. They have to say no, you know, to unjust law. Um, but I mean, the 40 million is a very sizable, huge group for the youth. But yeah, I mean, we are also very, very worried. That is Exoda. We are witnessing, you know, the real phase state. And now, you know, uh, and pardon, everybody's not only, I mean, now specifically youth, 
who knows? I mean, also there is another rule, voluntary. Those uh, army service, Radaya, they are calling back. A lot of Radaya soldiers are also very unhappy. They said, we already saw. Why do we have to go back and serve? This is the, this is the army way, very brutal. And when they have a problem, this is how they solve, you know? And also, I think maybe this is the beginning of the end, you know? It is a quite, the impact is not, uh, it's huge. I mean, there will be a lot more consequences about this conscription law. Than, than you think, I think. A lot of backfire with the army. What about those, you know, high-ranking armies, uh, they are children, are they going to uh, serve the army? I don't think so. Those who, who have money, they will were, they were bribe it. They will pay money, bribe. And then there is an exemption. There is, there is a, another opportunity for corruption, Marilyn, you know. That is a, I mean, sometimes, I mean, they just want to implement. I think it's so hard to implement, uh, but army, always army way, you know, they were false. And and they, there will be dire consequence uh, about this uh, conscription law. Yeah, as you know, there are issue of conscript, false conscription also in the opposition forces, some group uh, for young people. So that is, of course, now we are talking about a very different scale, a national scale. Uh, but unfortunately, it is an issue and it's very important to think about the one who don't want to fight, not for the good, not for the bad. At the same time, I think what you propose of resisting is only if it's organized, right? I mean, if one person is to resist by one young person, I mean, the risk of being killed is extremely high. So are there efforts to organize Oh yes, a boycott of the conscription, or is an impossible idea for the condition of Myanmar now as it is, without oh, I, putting at risk the lives of young people. Of course, I think there is a organized resistance. I mean, from non-violent saying no to this law as well. I mean, the Supreme Revolution is all about young people. We call it generations that Gen Z. They initiate. I mean, we are the outgoing generation, 1988, we're getting old. This generation actually, you know, have a very organized and many you know, innovative way. Even they start resist with the arms struggle with the home gun. Now, now the territory that they control. A lot of, I mean, I mean and I estimate those young generation. I have, I have very faith on these generations that Gen Z, they will find a way to resist. Definitely, you know, and some are saying that, all right, it is very dangerous to arm the young people <laughs> without knowing that who they are, you know, but they will be brainwashed and also don't think it is that easy. And then some young people said, we will turn the guns, you know, against them uh, once we got the guns, but it is not that easy either. Um, so, but I have very faith that, I mean, 14 million is a size ever, very strong force, organized. I know a lot of student union, youth groups, and find a way to define this law non-violently. And, you know, I think it is very unpopular about the, you know, in Mandalay, two women die just to queue, getting the visa to Thailand for their son. And there was a crowd. I mean, they ran over and they die. It is not for themselves, for their children leaving from country. I mean, this is the, this is the impact. Uh, I mean, they had the uh, visa office, you know, um, they're trying to get the passport for their children. It's a lot of sad story happened in Obama. Very hard for their parents. Doesn't matter, you know, in the past, if you are rich, you can bribe and then you get away. Now it's the impetus all across, you know, doesn't matter you have money or not, you cannot get away with this one. So I think I'm sure these generations there, Gen Z, they will find a way to resist. Um, I think maybe many different way. I mean, they are much more smarter, more organized. And also in terms of technology, they know how to use it. I'm sure there is already a lot of, a lot of prepare. I sh only show that in my presentation, only army trying to enforce, you know, conscription law, but there are a lot of, a lot of anti-conscription law movement that, you know, we, you will see that throughout this year, there will be more. That's why army, army don't down that, oh, don't, don't be panic. We will take only 5,000. Only one person, you know, and then you know, and on the, the whole year we only plan sixty thousand. They toned down. Actually, they were more than that, you know. So I'm sure that this young generation will find a way to say no to this conscription law, and there will be a lot. The whole year will be the narrative will be anti 
uh, conscription law movement. I'm sure there will be a lot more innovative way of attention and not making it possible. Um, I already see a lot of a lot of violence. Those who try to call it the uh, but the very sad thing about the dormitory happening, they are going a lot of people. I know people, they're not even, they are, they are not with the uniform. Going to ask the young people, you know, what is your uh, stick? There is a new form with your picture. And then they said, but you can get away if you pay uh, 500 on the six, 600 on the jet. We don't even know who they are, you know. There is a uh, lots of corruption. Just uh, pretend to be, they are real police or armies or recruitment department or, you know, then there is a lot of, a lot of happening. Even that some political parties make the announcement. If you've been asked, you know, you can contact us like the Kogodi party. They make that statement recently, I know, uh, about the, if you are being asked, you know, unlawfully asked to feed the fall and you have to pay the bribe, let us know. So it is happening, you know. So I am sure there will be, the more you oppress, the more you, <laughs> there will be, there will be, you know, uh, there will be against. Uh, I'm sure that by Miss Youth, this gen generation, Gen Z will find a way to, we we do resist this, you know, and uh, enforcement, you know, that that uh, at the gunpoint. I'm sure there will be the whole year. There will be a lot of resistance. You will see related to this particular uh, event. Okay, we have only a few more minutes. So, but there is another uh, question about the military. There are other news about the Thai military collaborating with KNU or Kareni army for the humanitarian corridor. And the, the last question about if indeed this, uh, the army managed to recruit, uh, forcibly recruit uh, these young people, some of them, can they trust them? I mean, if you are forcibly recruiting someone to fight for you, would they be able to trust those people? Oh, that is a way it's a what? <laughs> you are very good. Okay, yeah. so don't, don't answer this last. We leave it open, but answer the one on the Kareni. Thai whether, Army? Yes, whether there is, do you know anything, whether there is some collaboration between the Thai authorities or some talks between the Thai authority and the KNU or the Kareni army for the humanitarian corridor or not yet? Oh, when you talk about Thailand, um, especially like uh, dealing with border, it is like nation as they regard as a nation as security issues. So always Thai army involved, although, you know, the foreign ministry, or other politician want to do? You have do, to... they do have they start to talk about humanitarian corridor? Uh, the Thai defense minister was in Mesa recently, right? So <laughs> they're very busy. And unless, uh, you know, the uh, Narizon uh, 3 and 4, it is a border guard. We have a more than 2,020 kilometer um, share border along the mainly the Karen and Kareni area. All the area controlled by the uh, uh, Narendran Task Force 3, right? So the Thai army always played a very important role. Without the, their green light, I don't think uh, all the foreign ministry or other engagement got nowhere. So specifically, it is a national security council when you handle it. It is a ministry of foreign affairs and national security council involved with the Thai army. And I mean, whether do they have contact? I'm sure, I mean, because of the borderline is there all the time. And also border is uh, regarded as a national security issue and the army is involved. Definitely army involved heavily in that. I mean, also Thai army has a very good relation with Burmese army. Traditionally, army to army relation always. There was a mysterious, you know, rice uh, truck on the near the current area <laughs> without, I mean, that, because of they were trying to have the uh, trapped uh, Burmese army on the other side, you know. These are there also happening. I mean, time journalists reported uh, mysterious 70 truckloads of rice uh, found in the Mahon Sound and other, you know, that is, a, that is also history. It is in the news. So we know that. So I think army always involved and both, you know, ethnic and, uh, and Burmese army don't want to lose face with Thai army. So I'm sure, you know, but I don't know level or relationship because, uh, I mean, it is always there, borderline. Long border and regarded the security issue, who is in charge? I mean, is in charge from the time side. So the Narizon Three Task Force will be always very important role for the both Burmese Army and ethnic groups. 
So they do they involve, of course, but I don't know the level of involvement. Yeah, it's more in terms of the future for us and the Myanmar Red Cross, whether it involves also uh, these ethnic armies and to what level in preparation, if there is indeed preparation and how far uh, that goes. But okay, we can explore this more. Uh, the next uh, episode in one month uh, time, already this is quite a lot. Uh, to digest a few announcements, particularly related to C Junction uh, program. We will have an exhibition in, in Chamai, follow up exhibition with uh, RCD of Chamai University as well as Tanaka. And uh, there will be also a seminar uh, related to Myanmar uh, women. And the exhibition is about Chu Wei painting, which were exposed here in Bangkok at BACC, and now they are going to move uh, to Chiang Mai. So if you are in Chiang Mai on the 8th of March for Women Day, we will have the opening of the exhibition. The seminar is on 7 and 8, and it's a collaboration of RSCD and Tanaka. So please uh, follow and participate again if you are in, uh, in Chiang Mai. Thank you again, uh, though, for this uh, important conversation. And we will see you soon in Bangkok. I understand you will be here. So I hope to see you and see you also next month for the next. And thank you for all those who participate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lia. Thank you, Lia and C. Thank you, Sawadika. Thank you. Sawadika.